In 2001, DreamWorks Interactive had the rough skeleton of a first-person shooter, but knew it was missing something. So, Steven Spielberg suggested they call up famed author and painter Clive Barker, who had just published his book Cold Heart Canyon, a book that was repulsively and unsettlingly erotic. So, DreamWorks calls up Barker and says, Oh, look, we have this game, and it's stupid, like it's a piece of shit, and we've put so much money into it. Can you tell us how to write this thing? And Clive said something like, I would love to help you guys, because I feel sorry for how much your game sucks. And DreamWorks said, uh, Yeah, that's great. Uh, w one thing, could, could you not write any sex in it? Uh, I mean, I guess... So, Clive became their lifeline while they finished off production. With a completed game, EA was chosen to release Undying, which would coincide with a historic hot streak of EA releasing somewhat interesting games that would begin with Alice and end months later when Undying was released. In the 1920s, a paranormal investigator named Patrick Galloway receives a letter from Jeremiah Covenant, a war buddy with terminal cancer, asking for his help in unraveling the mysterious circumstances behind his family members' deaths. Once Patrick arrives, he's immediately greeted by ghosts and other monsters that, needless to say, should prob probably not be there. Patrick's buddy further explains that, as children, he and his siblings performed an occult ritual at a series of standing stones on a nearby island. Not expecting any of it to be real, they inadvertently summon a being called the Undying King. Once they reached adulthood, they began to die off one by one until only Jeremiah remained. There's a lot of care put into each of the returned siblings of Jeremiah Covenant. They each have a personality and a backstory that are explored in this little journal that came with the original physical release. It's written from the perspective of Jeremiah as he recounts the loss of his brothers and sisters and begins to doubt whether or not they are really gone. So, what I'll give Undying is that for the first 20 minutes of gameplay, it most certainly does seem like Undying has a great story. And as much as I appreciate Clive Barker and his work, of which I've consumed a lot, he's openly not well versed in video games or how they work. He's a brilliant artist, but there are certain things about Undying that his influence simply couldn't help. And while I can notice little touches that remind me of something he would dream up, Undying as a video game feels marred with problems that a good artist couldn't completely repair. I'm sure it came out a whole lot better than it would have had he not been involved. Pretty much any time you complete a portion of the game, there's a cutscene of one of the house's servants telling you an important clue or unlocking a new area. This was used as a simple way of pushing you in the right direction, um, but also why are these people still here? From the moment you set foot here there are maids and groundskeepers being killed left and right, but even until the end you'll still find people walking around and tidying up, going about their day as usual. There's, there's like monsters and ghosts everywhere and people are dying and none of them seem to be concerned enough to leave. Much of this game's exposition comes from optional reading materials that you could just as easily ignore as not even find. All the characters and even the weapons have an interesting origin and place in Undying's mythology, but it doesn't take long for the story to become complete background noise. Despite being so fleshed out, there were several moments where I had to check my objectives in the journal just so I could remember why any of this was happening. Why am I shooting these people? I have to ask myself that question enough in real life. Undying is a very challenging and unforgiving game. I played it on its medium setting, not expecting a lot of difficulty because really, I just wanted to capture footage of the whole game to lend credibility to me saying I played the whole thing. And it was fucking grueling. I think the most memorable part of this game is the first half hour or so, so going into this third playthrough, it was the only part I had a strong memory of. The slow buildup of creepy tension and that feeling of walking through a creepy house and knowing there's something in the next room but not knowing when it'll jump out or if it's behind you or above you. All that goes out of the window and what replaces it is a frantic, fast-paced, and frustrating shooter that has no intentions of playing fair. Enemies don't just make a beeline for you, giving you ample time to unload on them. They jump around and try to avoid your gunfire. Howlers are the most common enemy, and even these manage to be a powerful threat throughout the whole game, sometimes traveling in packs and sending one off to distract you while another one flanks you. You're going to spend a lot of time backpedaling and suffering through agonizing reload times, 
Every time a new creature is introduced, it's never like, oh, this is a stronger one of something you've seen before and it's just a different color, although they do do that also. They each pose a different threat and require different strategies. The pistol and the shotgun are the only traditional weapons you get, and both have alternate ammo that is effective to different enemies. There's also this cannon that shoots short-range ice bombs, a scythe that is very effective but requires you to be at close quarters and it also drains your mana, a crossbow that is useless unless you can sneak up on someone. The spells you gain help for a variety of situations, only one is a straightforward attack and others can help you see hidden clues, or shield you from damage, or even raise dead enemies to fight for you. You're allowed to have one weapon and one spell equipped simultaneously. You're probably going to die a lot, and it's always annoying because you have to watch a cutscene of you dying that you can't skip. and then it drops you at the entrance of whatever area you're in, which might be a long way back. I found myself saving pretty much after any encounter with an enemy. Rationing ammo and health items is crucial because, although you can find them pretty abundantly, you burn through them just as quickly. Overall, I'd say the gameplay is pretty solid with some decent variation in puzzles and lots of platforming sequences. My biggest problem is that it just kind of keeps going. So 80% of the time, I felt like I was wandering around looking for keys or for the next boss. I don't know if I could say this was a long game, I spent two whole days just doing nothing but playing Undying, and it still felt like weeks. It's draining. After every boss, I was just astonished that, that there was still more. And once we got to caveman times, I was completely over it. I was tired of watching myself die, and not being able to experience it firsthand. This is my home now. At the risk of repeating myself for like the third time, Undying truly has a captivating opening. It's one of a very small number of games that have made me afraid to continue. Though now that I'm an adult and I've had to deal with a lot of adult shit, The effect isn't as powerful, but when Undying came out, I found its atmosphere and tone to be chilling. The dimly lit mansion with howling monsters hiding in the corners, a barely effective weapon, voices showing you creepy images from other worlds and other places in time. It was so great, except for the fact that this picture doesn't make any sense, because according to Jeremiah's journal, his siblings died before he returned to Covenant Manor with his injuries, so here he is already with a war wound surrounded by his living family. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. The more you play Undying, the more the illusion of atmosphere starts to slip away. At first, it's frightening because the house is unpredictable and you're ill-equipped. It feels like a survival horror game. But the other two-thirds of the game are all jump, jump, shoot, shoot, shoot. It loses its subtlety. The sound design still stands out to me as being the game's strongest asset. Creatures sound otherworldly. The house sounds otherworldly. Down to the unsettling wind tunnel-like room tone. It just feels like a place you should not be. The Howlers are the most effective creepy enemy on their howls alone. Before Undying becomes an action game, there was a legitimate sense of dread when I would hear them. The music is pretty solid even if some of the tracks are recycled from other DreamWorks games and some are public domain. See, there's that Nocturne theme again. Well, I don't know what it's really called, but that's what I call it. I own a physical copy of this game, and after installing it, it was super laggy no matter what resolution I set it to, until I played it in a window. Then it was like it was being fast-forwarded. Dialogue started overlapping dialogue. Trek Galloway. A fled from Ireland and listen, hung home in Paris and London with before no I real purpose till the great war started. So because we just live in a world where we're forced to buy games we already own, I got the GOG release, which ran flawlessly, but also shines a light on just how much this game has aged. Characters look really blocky, skyboxes look very low resolution, bullet decals and bodies disappear in seconds, but I suppose they lampshade that in Patrick's journal. 
My memories of Undying make this game look a lot better than it does now. I remember being blown away by this hallway with the billowing curtains on it and the pale orange light coming through the windows. It still has some charm to it and the graphics don't detract from the more successful scares that- FUCK! Clive Barker's Undying is a game with a lot of promise and a lot of aspects that work. I think there is a really tragic clashing of Undying's highly thought out story, mythology, and tone with its insistence that it be a fast paced, action packed shooter. Undying is a challenging game and the challenge is not always fair or forgiving or fun. Defeating a boss or completing a tough segment doesn't ever feel satisfying because there's never any respite, it just keeps going. As soon as you overcome an obstacle, a servant will walk up to you and be like, hey I don't know why I'm still here but something weird is going on outside you should go check. And then you're right back into it. It's tiresome. I can't deny that this game sounds and looks cool from a design standpoint. Aaron is one of the most unsettling things I've faced in a game, and Clive Barker would dream up a jawless, skinless, hook-wielding corpse. It's tough for me to be critical of this game because I used to hold it in pretty high regard. When DreamWorks approached Clive Barker, it was because they didn't have any plot or motive to your actions within the game, and they did the worst thing they could have done, which is not make the plot all that important anyway. Sometimes games work with very minimal plot, but when you get an amazing writer to write your story, it should be kind of important. They took the advice of a brilliant mind and watered it down to make room for more shooting and stuff, and that's a tough thing to move past. It's tough for me to move past things. I, I tend to dwell on the past. At least that's what my ex would tell me. She would also say things like, you say really threatening things in your sleep, and why do you have a scrapbook with hair clippings? <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's I, like, I, like I just need the hair, so we're gonna have to move past this. And if we can't, you, you might end up in the book.